Whoa, it's sword and shield time, baby. Let's go. Okay, here we go. The one weapon that I thought was utter trash in pretty much the majority of games in the Monster Hunter series seems to actually be pretty cool. I also wanted to give a big thanks to everybody for supporting the channel. We hit 10k recently. If you're watching this on release, like today, Saturday, I will be streaming a celebratory stream, so make sure you come over and check out twitch.tv slash superradlemon. Again, thank you so much to everybody that's been supporting the channel lately. I, I didn't expect it to be where it is right now. I, I didn't expect to have so many people watching the videos and checking out the content. Thank you so much. And hopefully you enjoy this one. Uh, Sword and Shield, history, history, Sword and Shield. Here we go. Out of all the weapons in the Monster Hunter series, we've already talked about some of the most iconic. Everyone knows about the greatsword, the hammer, even the longsword is incredibly popular, but there's another weapon with a long history, one most players know about because it's generally the default selection at the start of various games. A weapon that has been around since Monster Hunter's inception, but from a surface level looks fairly ineffective. Its high utility and effectiveness are hidden behind the weapon's low raw damage, but I promise you. There's much more to this weapon than what first meets the eye. Underneath the hood is a deadly elemental contender that can be set up for almost any scenario. Fast attacks, high mobility, and incredible utility. The sword and shield can really surprise you if you give it the chance, and we're going to take a look at that today. As I mentioned in previous videos, I like to take your opinions into consideration when it comes to which weapon I will cover next. I made sure to take a peek at all of the comments, and there seemed to be an overwhelming amount of them asking for sword and shield. I'll be sure to throw up a poll or something to determine the next weapon video. If you want your weapon to be covered next, be sure to let me know in the comments, and please consider liking and subscribing. YouTube still has my family held hostage, I recently received an ear in the mail from them, and I'm starting to lose hope. Please Susan, if you're watching this, please give me my kids back, I promise to produce better content for the Google overlords. In the meantime, I'm Super Rad, and this is the history of the Sword and Shield. There's a good chance that if you're introduced to Monster Hunter for the first time that the sword and shield will be the weapon you try out before anything else. It's generally the default equipment on the hunter and potentially has one of the most easy to understand and inviting playstyles to start with. In a game where most weapons are slow, methodical, clunky, and require a large degree of patience, the sword and shield help alleviate that slightly by going more in the opposite direction. Let's talk about attacks first. The main combo you'll see hunters using is the combo slash, which allows them to attack three times in a row by pressing up on the right analog stick consecutively. This is probably the most used attack when fighting generally, as it allows for consistent damage overall, but most hunters would cancel out of the final hit to begin again and may even start the combo with the jumping slash I will mention shortly. The combo can also be ended with the second move in the sword and shield arsenal, the spin slash, which can be activated by pressing left or right on the analog stick. This attack can be used by itself any time during the typical combo attack to cut it short. While it offers higher damage, it comes at the cost of a longer animation. Generally, it's better to save this for if you have a big opening after a combo and probably shouldn't be used on its own as a combo attack will do more overall damage than a single spin slash. The jumping slash can be performed either as a draw attack or by pressing down on the right analog stick while unsheathed. The nice thing about this attack is that using it beforehand allowed the hunter to weave it into the combo maneuver. There's also a rolling attack that can only be performed after an evasive roll, which is great for starting combos over. Additionally, there is a final move that is weak, but allows the user to attack while keeping their shield up. Players can also perform a bit of a pseudo infinite by attacking after an evade into their triple slash combo and then evading again to start the combo over, rather than waiting for the ending animation. I don't know how effective it is overall, but it's there, as an option. Maybe good. <laughs> and yeah, that's right, there's a shield. Similar to the greatsword, the sword and shield has the ability to block incoming attacks. These don't completely prevent damage, but can heavily mitigate it at the cost of stamina, and that's really where this weapon begins to shine, its utility. The main advantage of choosing this weapon over others is its agility. Not only does the weapon have the ability to block, but hunters can still actively move at full speed with it unsheathed, unlike other weapons that slow the hunter down while carrying them. 
Think of it as taking the utility of the greatsword block and hammer charge movement and mixing them together to make a defensive but highly mobile combination. There's a key downside to this weapon to help even it out in terms of effectiveness, generally how weak it is in comparison to any other weapon within this generation. Seriously, due to its low raw, if you're only managing to get one or two hits in, you're dealing virtually no damage to a monster at all. And even if you are managing to get in a large amount of attacks, due to how often the weapon was hitting a monster, its sharpness would plummet excessively, leaving hunters in a situation where they would find themselves bouncing more often than not. Well, that sounds awful, right? And I don't blame you for thinking so. Honestly, Sword and Shield was probably at its all-time weakest this generation on paper, but outside of utility, it did make up for its low raw damage and low sharpness in a major way. Elemental damage. Which was incredibly effective against the right matchups in Generation 1. For example, there's a weapon called Eternal Strife, and while it has the lowest raw out of any Sword and Shield in the game, it has the highest elemental damage as well. And it just so happens to be Dragon Element, something incredibly useful against some of the harder matchups in this release. Compared to raw, elemental damage is going to be much more consistent in its damage output due to modifiers, meaning the right sword and shield could seriously go a long way. I also want to point out that while sword and shield on paper seems like it's not particularly great in given situations, the inherent clunkiness and brokenness of Monster Hunter 1 allowed it to shine alongside other bonkers weapons like Lance, which we'll get to in another video. Now I know you're saying to yourself, but super rad, we're forgetting that the weapon can use items while unsheathed. Well, slow down, King, because because while that is a staple feature of Sword and Shield, it wasn't added into the series until Generation 2. Let's take a look now. There's not too much specifically changed for the weapon within this generation aside from the inclusion of a new attack and a new key feature. First is the new upward slash that can be performed. By pressing R and triangle at the same time on the PSP, you know, R1 on PS2, the player can perform an upward slash that can reach higher vertically than most attacks. By performing a jumping slash and pressing triangle again, the player can combo into an upward slash out of it and extending that combo into the triple slash seen in the previous generation. This move can also be done after a roll. It should also be pointed out that using it standalone as a combo starter wasn't very viable until later on in the series. Something similar to this maneuver was first seen in Generation 1, but really began to get fleshed out here. And again, the final attack of the 3 hit combo wasn't very effective. Most players would find themselves cancelling out of the animation with a roll before the final hit and quickly get back into the start of the original combo. I should also point out that the jumping slash gained super armor in this generation, so while you can still take damage, it's not interruptible and great for pressure. While a new attack is great, it's great, the biggest addition in this generation is the weapon's ability to use items while unsheathed. By pressing R and square, the hunter will use whichever item they currently have equipped, similar to if they didn't have their weapon unsheathed at all. They can drink potions, set traps, and sharpen, though some of this will sheathe the weapon after use. This is surprisingly huge as a mechanical inclusion because it helps boost the overall utility and balance of the weapon, allowing it to better compete with the other options that focus on higher damage. And like the greatsword, it can even block attacks like Gypsaro's flashes. Sword and Shield really did have it all. In perfect play, you'd be doing your best to not get hit, potentially never taking any damage if you're some sort of godly player. But the majority of players aren't at that level, and if any weapon cushions taking damage or finding yourself in a risky situation, it was Sword and Shield. Okay, so a major change for Generation 2, but not a lot of changes overall. What about Generation 3? Well, we're going to head over to Moga Village and see for ourselves. So Tri comes out and with it Sword and Shield gains multiple changes in its moveset. The tried and true triple slash combo still exists, but the button dedicated to the round slash has been altered. Instead of the typical round slash, you can instead press the button twice to perform a new horizontal slash into a vertical slash combo that's good for hitting above the hunter. The nice thing about the inclusion of this new combo is that all of these moves can now be chained together. Jumping slash into triple slash into the new upper swing combo and finishing off with a round slash is now possible and really complements the flow of the weapon especially when an opening presents itself. 
Again, you can perform a sort of pseudo-infinite by cancelling the animation with an evade and immediately re-entering the combo. I don't do it very well in the footage that you're watching. And don't forget that some of these attacks were better than others in motion values and animations, meaning players may cancel out of specific hits and continue on with others. Try continued with the additions by adding a shield bash maneuver. By holding a direction and pressing the A button twice, the hunter would first swing their shield and then follow up with a forward thrusting shield bash attack, which also gains a round slash finisher if you continue it. In Portable 3rd and 3 Ultimate, the new combo that leads into an upper slash now has its own finisher, making it a secondary triple strike combo. Now the hunter will perform a quick horizontal slash into an upper slash and finish with a stronger round slash. These two forms of triple slash combos can be woven together slightly to perform a variety of combos depending on the hunter's preference or the situation at hand. For example, during the triangle attack you can begin the circle combo whether you do a full combo or not. However, you can't start the circle combo and mix in the triangle combo at this time. These changes would carry over from Portable 3rd into 3 Ultimate, which outside of water combat didn't really add anything to the sword and shield formula. You know what did add a lot to the sword and shield combo though? Generation 4, baby. Uh, at least I hope it did, since I haven't actually looked at it while writing this line in the script. Whew, turns out I was right. We got some new shit on the block for you right here, ladies and gentlemen. Say hello to the Backstab. A brand new evasive option that can be activated after almost any attack in the Sword and Shield arsenal. By holding back on the left analog stick and pressing A, the hunter will jump backwards, allowing them to get clear of any close range monster's attacks. The cool thing about this is that it can be followed up with many options. First, the charge slash attack by holding the A button, which outputs a rather high amount of damage for the Sword and Shield. The combo also gets the upward slash finisher by pressing X after a charge strike upward slash, doesn't that mean you can immediately go into a combo afterward? Yup, and what's that? Damage output from my sword and shield? This can't be possible. Well, guess what, King? You're going to be destroying monsters with this weapon from Gen 4 onward, utterly obliterating them. It's almost unfair. Want to get right back into the fray after a backstep? Instead of holding A to charge, the hunter can perform a run-in attack similar to their draw attack to close the distance and get back into the fight as quickly as possible. Finally, is the monster advancing on you despite the backstep? Keep the aggression coming by backstepping and following up with an upward slash in place. The world is your oyster. Oh, did I mention this puppy has iframes? That's right, on top of giving sword and shield everything every other weapon had at this point, they also built in an iframe dodge mechanic into it. Did they give iframes to the longsword fade slash? No, but they did give them to the sword and shield backstep. Time to start another petition. Your mobility options are gigantic now. There's nothing this weapon can't realistically do, and your only real drawback is requiring the right weapons for the right scenarios. Elemental options are still incredibly important to this weapon type, more so than most others, but Sword and Shield make up for it with more and more mobility and utility with each release. But Super Rad, what about the jump attacks? Sit down, champ, I got you covered. You got your basic jump attack, boom, and yes, you can combo out of it, so go nuts. You know what else you got? Charge in attack off the ledge. Yeah, you saw that, right? It sends you a flying forward off the ledge for a quick slash. Can you combo out of it? You betcha. Isn't that dumb? Yes it is. <laughs> What's more dumb though? Attacking up a ledge. By charging towards a ledge or pressing the A button while climbing up, you can perform a jumping upward slash maneuver. You're just going to be swinging this stump on a stick around willy nilly the entire hunt and guess what? It's gonna work because this weapon is so open ended in its options. Moving on, Monster Hunter 4 wasn't the only game in this generation to bring a lot to the table. Just like every other weapon, Generations and Generations Ultimate introduced plenty of new mechanics, styles, and arts for Sword and Shield to make use of. And one very unique mechanic, oils. What are oils? They're a brand new mechanic that help diversify the options the hunter has in battle when it comes to how their weapon will act. When applying them, they'll last for two minutes and add a colored glow to the hunter's sword. But what are each of the oils and what do they do? Well, there's four in total, starting with the affinity oil that will add 30% affinity to the hunter's weapon for the duration of the effect. Next, there's an exhaustion oil that not only deals more exhaust damage over time, but also KO damage when attacking a monster's head. Say goodbye to the hammer because we don't need it anymore, we're stubby boys now. Next up is Park Breaker Oil that makes it easier to break parts on a monster, and Mind's Eye Oil which prevents the hunter from bouncing off of them. Doesn't that sound nice on a weapon like the Sword and Shield that attacks rapidly? Sword Oils opened up the door for what was possible with the weapon and made it a true powerhouse in comparison to the other options out there. What many may still consider a beginner weapon with no depth was now arguably one of the most mechanically diverse weapons in the series. Surprisingly, this weapon was not one that focused on the Valor style released in Generations Ultimate. Instead, it was Guild and Striker 
styles that really shined, and we'll take a look at them both now. Of course, guild style is what you would expect from previous entries in the series. It focuses on keeping the weapon similar and moveset to what returning players have experienced already and allows for two arts to be applied at a given time. The reason people may choose striker style over guild is due to how powerful the art selection is for this weapon, and being able to equip three arts at a time that charge faster than normal really gives you a boost within a fight. The main aspect you lose in striker style is the backstep maneuver, which is a popular option among sword and shield mains, so let's see what the best arts are and what they do that's so appealing. First and arguably the most important art is Chaos Oil, which was introduced in Generations Ultimate. This is seriously a bonkers ability and one every sword and shield hunter should be using. Remember all the oils I mentioned before? Well this ability will apply each of their effects at one time for a given duration. Tier 1 and Tier 2 of this art have the abilities be a bit weaker than if you just used the oil by itself, but Tier 3 offers the full effects of each oil. On top of all of this, you get extended duration with Tier 2, but a shorter duration with Tier 3 to balance it out. You also have the ability to stack an additional manual oil to boost the effect further. It even applies faster while the art is activated. Imagine activating Chaos Oil 3 and applying Affinity Oil for a 60% affinity boost without any armor skills. Good luck getting that third tier though, as it's locked behind a Hyper Golden and Silver Lost quest that will have you pulling your hair out for weeks on end. Round Force is the other major inclusion, essentially making you invincible during its animation. It's a spinning attack with a wide range and deals high damage, making it useful for keeping up DPS against particularly aggressive monsters. I've been told this is a contested statement, but the main portion of your damage output can come from this ability, and you can really cripple yourself as a sword and shield main by not utilizing it. If I didn't mention a particular style or art that you use within this section, I apologize. But these were the most effective and heavily utilized of the group and deserved the main focus within this video. Video. Next we'll move on to Generation 5 and see what World, Iceborne, and Rise bring to the Sword and Shield table. So to get this out of the way, similar to how the hammer can slide down slopes while charging, the sword and shield can perform an advancing slash on a slope and begin the sliding animation with their weapon out. This allows them to guard while sliding, which is a nice little inclusion, but you'll most likely be using it to perform jumping slashes, so whether your weapon is out or not doesn't really matter. There is a new Helmbreaker move, however, which will output multiple hits on the way down and can be performed by using the advancing slash into a runnable wall. There's a few new moves added as well, namely the spiral slash, which is activated during any combo by pressing triangle in a direction. The hunter will face the direction selected and quickly swing their sword toward it. This move can be followed up with a quick thrusting motion for decent damage or many of the other moves in the sword and shield arsenal. Then there's the hard bash which can be performed by continuing through the shield bash combo with the circle button. The ability to weave all these moves together begins to give the sword and shield true infinites without needing the evade rule, meaning the uptime of damage has increased significantly in world. The backsteps charge mechanic has been updated slightly as well. Now if the attack connects the hunter will automatically perform the scaling slash and launch themselves into the air. From here they can choose between the aerial jumping slash or a new falling bash attack that uses the shield. Also by performing the power combos or shield combos and pressing circle afterward you could automatically enter the backstep stance. Funny enough this weapon could use the slinger without the weapon unsheathed before iceborne, so at the time of writing this I'm pretty curious what it got in the expansion to make up for that. Luckily we're going to move on to iceborne right now. The main additions to every weapon in iceborne are the slinger burst and clutch claw mechanics. Sword and shield specifically get the ability to press L2 after an evasive roll to perform a launching uppercut attack with the clutch claw out. If it connects, the hunter automatically grapples to the monster. This is advantageous due to it not only being an incredibly quick way to grapple onto the monster, but makes it so that it only takes one clutch claw attack afterwards to tenderize. Now slinger burst functions slightly different in comparison to the other weapons, due to the fact that the sword and shield can already use the slinger with the weapon unsheathed. By pressing R3, you can change the mode the slinger is in. If you want to use it normally, keep it in the default mode, but if you want the ability to use the slinger burst, switch it, and it'll be a burst every time. No combo starter needed. Now that's not all the weapon has to offer. There's a brand new mechanic introduced in Iceborne for the Sword and Shield, as if it didn't have enough going for it already. I'm talking about the perfect rush combo, and honestly, wow, it's insane. The move is activated by pressing the triangle after either a backstep or a slinger burst, and seems to be designed to promote appropriate timing of button presses. As the hunter performs the combo, well-timed button presses will reward additional raw damage, elemental damage, and status effects, making it incredibly useful for big openings on whatever you're hunting. 
Finally, moving on to Rise, guess what? They got rid of the infinite. The ability to press a direction with the triangle button or X button in this scenario during a combo to extend said combo has been removed completely. That's right, you guys were too powerful and Capcom realized they had to do something about you. The other main mechanical changes are how Perfect Rush functions, as it can finish the combo in two ways. First, by performing the combo regularly, the hunter will now be launched off of the monster and into the air. This is the same animation we see when performing a scaling slash in World. If you'd rather not commit to a launch, you can instead press A to perform a round slash which is quicker and doesn't send you into the air. As we all know from the demo, no matter how high you are in the air, the monster can still hit you for some reason, and hopefully they fix that in the final release. Please. Please Capcom. On to Silkbind moves, the first is Falling Shadow, and I feel like this is a running theme at this point, but I really don't understand its inclusion. Sword and Shield means please let me know in the comments what I'm missing here, if I'm missing anything. All this move seems to do is launch you forward and upward in the air, and if you connect with the monster you go into the Scaling Slash, which just lets you perform your typical finishers. I don't see why you would want to use this over the next move as you already have so many ways to enter this state. Now the Windmill Silkbind attack is great, it's like Round Force which I talked about previously previously from generations and continues to have iframes at the start of the animation, making it perfect for evading an initial attack and then slaughtering the monster with high damage. I love it. It's perfect, it makes sense as an inclusion, and complements the weapon greatly. Good job Capcom. Now that's all I really have to say on Rise. Don't forget that this information comes from the demo and we already know there will be additional silk by moves to choose from as well as potentially the ability to change our basic moves as well. At least that's what I heard down the rumor mill, so it's not 100%. One last thing I can mention is that the ability to simply hold A after a power charge combo for an automatic back step has been removed and instead now forces the player to hold back on the analog stick similar to a traditional back step. If I haven't made it clear throughout the majority of this video, the sword and shield is not what you expect from a first glance. Even today, the weapon seems to not be given the credit it's due. It's truly a jack of all trades and master of some, offering almost every major utility mechanic other weapons focus on while bringing many of its own unique mechanics to the table. On top of that, it has high mobility and ways to utilize its elemental advantages to become truly monstrous in the amount of damage it can output. Anyway, that's all I have for you today in regards to the Sword and Shield. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Share it with one or two of your friends if you don't mind, it really goes a long way. Let me know what your favorite weapon is and what weapon you want me to cover next. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.